Hello and good morning to everyone everywhere. Welcome to the 11 a.m. Sunday Assembly at the Orange Vale Church of Christ. My name is Chuck Polis, and in addition to our online assembly that's happening right now, we also have an in-person indoor assembly that happens at 9 a.m. on Sundays. And so if you're in the neighborhood next Sunday, we pray that you'll join us. Later on today at 6, we also have a Zoom adult Bible class that's looking at the Gospel of John. And tonight we're going to be finishing up John chapter 12. And then on Wednesday nights, our Zoom adult Bible class at 7 is studying the book of Genesis. And right now we're in Genesis chapter 42. We also have a Zoom children's Bible class that happens at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesdays. And that class is for children between the ages of 8 and 12 years old. Plus, we also offer a more comprehensive work-at-your-own-pace kind of Bible study with the Real Live Bible Study Helper. And you can sign up for that by visiting our website at ovchurch.org and clicking on the banner for World Bible School. And if you want any information about any of those classes, even some tech support on how to get connected with Zoom, please message us through Facebook, YouTube, or you can email me directly at minister at ovchurch.org so that we can get you the Zoom ID and the class materials that you need and get you connected. Now, if you're old school, we offer an in-person Bible study examining the life of Christ here at our church building on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. and all are welcome to attend. Even if you're new school, you can still join in with the old school. Anyway, we also want to make sure that you're aware that after every 9 a.m. Sunday assembly here at our building, we have a Cookies and Cocoa Fellowship, formerly our lemonade social, but with warmer drinks for the season. But you can still get lemonade if you want. Anyway, we have drinks and snacks, and of course, everyone's invited to fellowship with us. We've been asked to pray for a couple of folks. One is Joe, uh, Joe Ludovici, or Joe Ludovici, uh, and he has uh, contracted COVID and has pneumonia. He's struggling, so we need to pray for Joe and his family. We also want to pray for our sister Pat, who is in the process in, to move to a new home. Pat's pro in the process of moving to a new home, so we want to pray for Pat and her family too. And as always, uh, if you have any announcements or prayer concerns uh, that you'd like to share with us, please let us know. Let's pray. Most Holy Father, dear God, we want to thank you again for another day. Father, we ask that you'll bless our assembly today as we sing songs to you and, and, and study from your word. And we're also mindful of Joe, who's struggling with COVID and pneumonia, that you'll be with him and his family and, and help him to overcome Father, we also pray that you'll be with our sister Pat as she moves to a new home. We pray that the move will go well for her and that she'll uh, enjoy her new place. Father, we ask that you'll do all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is singing the book of Colossians. I'll be reading Colossians 3, 5 through 10 from the New International Version. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these days, in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator.
It's at this time that we would like to invite you to join us in sharing the Lord's Supper wherever you may be. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter shares with Christians there who are having to deal with abusive masters and oppressive conditions and persecutions, these encouraging words, starting in verse 19. He writes, For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. When Jesus came preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God, he endured terrible ridicule and suffering, ultimately at the cross. But he did so willingly because he was faithfully fulfilling the mission that God gave him. Today, you might be suffering for one reason or another, might be that you're sick or God only knows why you're suffering, but you are. Just remember that Jesus, who did absolutely nothing wrong and only did things to bless others and to try to lead them to God, suffered terribly for you and me. And so he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Let's take this time to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us in the bread and the cup. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for this bread, this bread that represents your son's body. As we partake of it, help us do so in a worthy that's pleasing to you. In Christ we pray. Shall we continue in prayer? Most Holy Father, again, we want to thank you for this fruit of the vine, this cup that represents your son's blood shed on the cross. Father, as we think about that precious gift given to all of us, Father, might we do so in a way, again, that is worthy, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. That concludes the Lord's Supper, and it's at this time, out of a matter of convenience, that we take up the offering. Again, I want to thank all those who have continued to mail in their support or bring by their support for the church here in Orangevale. May God continue to bless you as you have blessed others. You know, it's clear that the church is made up of Christians with Jesus as our head, Colossians 1.18, and the primary mission of the church of the Christians who make up the body of believers is to spread the, the good news of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that we do that is by preaching and teaching from a central location from our building here in Orangevale, as well as online and you know even by good old fashioned uh, mail. And it does take financial resources to maintain all that. And so we ask that if you can help support the ministry here in Orangevale and the missions that we help to support around the world, that you bless us as you have been blessed. Let's pray. Father God, again, we want to thank you so much for blessing us with all good things. Father, we're especially thankful for your son, Jesus, and his sacrifice. And Father, as we think about all that you've blessed us with, help us to give back to you in a sacrificial way so that your kingdom might grow. In Jesus' name we pray. 
As always, you're welcome to bring your offering by during your next visit here to our church building, or you could use whatever services your bank offers, like bill pay, to uh, transmit us some funds, or you can mail us a check and address it to 5915 Main Avenue, Orange Vale, California, 95662. It's at this time that we would like to encourage you to sing along with the song before the message today. Angry words, oh let them never from the tongue and bridle slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soil the lid. Love one another, blessed the Savior. Children obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus at the same children obey the blessed command. Love is much too pure and holy, friendship is too sacred far. For a moment's reckless folly, lust to desolate. Brightest leaves of life are broken by a single angry word. Love one another, thus at the same Children obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus at the same Hello again. You know, I think it's fair to say that all of us have said something that we wished we didn't say. If my mother said it once, you know, I bet you she said it a thousand times. Think before you speak. But, you know, that's not always easy. Think about it. Every day we speak thousands of words, some of us <laughs> more than others. And that's a lot of opportunity to say the wrong things. And God knows that's a problem for us. And so he warns us about the power of our speech. And he also gives us some ways that we can tame our tongue so that our faith and our speech reflect each other. And so as we continue our Faith at Work sermon series from the book of James, we see that almost the entire third chapter is dedicated to how we speak. Clearly, the way we speak to one another and to God is important to God. And we see that reflected in the book of James. For example, back in chapter 1, James reminded us in verse 19 that everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. In other words, you know, we need to slow down and Think before we speak. And then down in verse 26, James stresses the importance of controlling what we say, reminding us that if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. And these things are all important if we want to have a faith that works. And that's because our faith is shown by the things that we do and the things that we say. So, let's see what God has to tell us in James chapter 3 and verses 1 through 12. There James writes, 
Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, we make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now, in our text here, we see three truths about our tongue and a couple things that we can do to tame our tongue. So, first, James says that our tongue is small but powerful. Again, in verses 3 through 5, James perfectly illustrates this point with three common realities when he writes, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Okay, so back in verse 3, James reminds us of the fact that very large horses are controlled by very small bits. Now, it's my understanding that horses weigh somewhere around 2,000 pounds. I don't know. I don't have a horse, and I don't have a scale that could take care of a horse. But I believe they weigh about 2,000 pounds. And, of course, they're incredibly powerful. But even a small child can control and direct a horse by that small bit that's placed in the horse's mouth connected to the reins. And that's because that bit is placed in one of the most sensitive parts of the horse's mouth, right? Think about it. You know, have you ever had like little kids when you were a parent or grandkids just go stick their fingers in your mouth and yank? It sure isn't comfortable. Anyway, that's how it kind of works with a horse, right? That's the principle of the bit. All right, the second thing that James illustrates for us is the truth that large ships are steered by small rudders. I mean, anyone who's spent some time on a ship or as a vessel of their own knows that no matter their size, they're steered by a small rudder in comparison to the rest of the ship. And so it only takes a gentle tilt of the rudder to move the whole ship. And the third word picture that James puts in our minds here from our text is the fact that it only takes a small spark to start a large fire. Living here in the Golden State, I can tell you that it doesn't take all that much to start a fire at all that could end up devastating entire communities. So what's James' point with the bit, the rudder, and the spark? Well, simply that they are small in comparison to the rest of the things that they control. You got the horse, the ship, and the fire, right? Well, so is our tongue. It's just a small part of our body, but it can cause some incredible trouble. The point is, even though it's small, it's oh so powerful. And so, 
Second, James says that the tongue can be uncontrollably dangerous. It can be uncontrollably dangerous. Again, back in our main text, this time in verses 6 through 8, we read that the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, keeping with the illustration of a fire as compared to the power of the tongue, James goes beyond the fact that it only takes a small spark to start a raging fire. The truth is, that once that fire gets going, it's almost impossible to stop. It's uncontrollable. It's dangerous. We only have to look at the devastating Dixie Fire that started back on July 13th and wasn't fully contained until October 25th, just a few weeks ago from today. In all, 963,309 acres were burned, including several small towns just obliterated like Greenville and Canyon Dam, home to Sierra Bible Camp. The truth is, fire is incredibly hard to control which is why we should do whatever we can to never start a fire. James also talks about how we have managed to tame all kinds of wild animals, right? And you can enjoy those when you go to the zoo, right? You just go there, you see these animals doing everything, and they're all, you know, relatively tame. That said, while we can tame those animals, it's almost impossible to tame our tongue with James calling it a restless evil, full of deadly poison, kind of like a venomous snake on the loose. You know, and I don't know too many people that try to wrangle snakes. Most sane people simply run from snakes, you know? And that's how James wants us to treat a venomous tongue, right? Get away from it. Again, James' point is that the tongue can become uncontrollably dangerous. It can set the whole course of a person's life on fire, destroying reputations, families, futures. Third, James reminds us that the tongue is terribly inconsistent. Again, back in James chapter 3 this time in verses 9 and 10, James writes, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men. Who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers. This should not be. And he's right, isn't it? This should not be. How in the world can people praise God and worship and then a few minutes later demoralize or criticize or gossip or insult someone? There's not much need to explain it any more than what he did. Because, you know, the inconsistency in our speech and actions is sadly all too evident. But the problem is that our speech is supposed to be consistent with godly speech and godly actions. And so James points that out with two rhetorical questions showing consistency and nature in verses 11 and 12. Again, saying, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Well, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. You say, well, okay, well, what the, what's the answer to all those questions, James? Well, it's no, 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 all right? It's, it's, it's silly. They can't, all right? And that's because we all know that the same spring doesn't produce sweet water sometimes and then bitter water another time or fresh water sometimes and then salt water another times and apple trees don't bear oranges and and fig trees don't bear pears and all that stuff it just doesn't happen but again that's the point we need to be more consistent with our speech just like the spring and the olive trees and the grapevines and the fig trees you know just think about it if we're going to be god's people then the output 
or the fruit of our lips needs to be consistent with good and godly actions and speech. It's just the way it's supposed to work, you know. Again, James told us here that the tongue is small but powerful, right? He also told us that it's uncontrollably dangerous and can be terribly inconsistent. And while that's the reality of the situation, you know, do we just throw our hands up and just kind of give up? Well, some people might, but God wants his people to learn to tame our tongues. And with God's help, we can. And God clearly believes that we can because there's so many scriptures that talk about good and godly speech. So just what is God's plan for taming the tongue? Well, it's fair to say that there are good and bad things that come out of our mouths. And the only way that we can avoid those bad things is to know what they are so that we can avoid them, right? So what kind of speech should we avoid? Well, take a look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. There the Apostle Paul tells us, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So first on our list is unwholesome talk or corrupt talk, depending upon your translation. And what that is, is all kinds of profanity and vulgar speech, right? Everything from F-bombs to vulgar slang for people and body parts. I don't know, maybe instead of someone limiting their vocabulary with F-bombs, maybe they should actually say what they mean. Like, you know, wow, that really hurt. Or that's amazing. Or I don't want anything to do with you. At least say what you actually want to say rather than using some sort of foul, vulgar language. Still, that's only half the equation, right? Because we're not, we're not only supposed to not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but instead we're supposed to say things that are helpful for building others up according to their needs. Just think about it. Instead of cussing someone out for doing something bad or doing a bad job, maybe you should say, you know, something like, you know, I, I know that's not the outcome we wanted. You know, do, do you need some help to get the job done better? You know, you kind of get the idea, right? You know, sure, it's a harder thing to do for us to think about all that and actually get involved to help things along, but it's the good and godly way to speak and act, showing our faith at work. Another thing that we should do is avoid complaining and arguing. And I know that can be really hard for some people because it's all they seem to do. They complain and argue about sports or about work or about food or about the government or whatever post they can find on Facebook or Twitter or wherever. I mean, really, it's kind of just, ah, quit it already, you know? Again, the Apostle Paul has godly words of advice for the complainer over in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15, where he tells us to do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. You're not going to shine if you're busy complaining and arguing all the time. Now you're going to become a part of that mud muck. But yet another thing that's important for the Christian to avoid in their speech is gossip and slander. Proverbs 20 and verse 19 says it this way, A gossip betrays a confidence. So avoid a man or woman who talks too much. All right? Just think about all the damage that gets done when people talk about others behind their back. This is one of Satan's most effective tools to destroy friendships and families and even the Lord's church. And so before anyone says anything about anyone else, they should just stop and ask themselves, you know, why am I about to talk about this person? Especially if they're not there, you know? All right. Fourth, we should avoid lying. I don't really know if we need to say much about that, except, you know, 
Lying is usually covered by more lying and more lying and more lying until there's nothing left that's true. So, don't lie. And fifth, good and godly speech avoids negativity that criticizes and tears people down. Basically, remember the old adage. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. That said, there is a proper time for correction and constructive criticism, but it must be approached wisely with a lot of love and gentleness. Okay, so that's God's plan for taming the tongue. What about God's plan for using the tongue? Well, first of all, we are supposed to use our tongue for praise and for prayer and for confession and thanksgiving. We should also use our tongue for teaching others about the love of God, teaching them about the gospel, right? And like we already mentioned, we should use our tongue to encourage and build others up according to their needs. Solomon says it this way over in Proverbs 25 and verse 11, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. In other words, it's beautiful, right? And he adds over in Proverbs 12 and verse 25 saying, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather be cheered up than torn down, right? I think we all do. We all want to be cheered up, right? Another way that we can properly use our speech is to bless our relationships, to bless one another. And we can do that by, by learning some of the most important short sentences and making them a part of our vocabulary. Word, phrases like, I love you, or thank you, or I'm sorry, please forgive me, or how can I help out? Or maybe, could you help me with this? I'm sure you get the idea. Still, I know it's hard to control your speech just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean that I've got it easy. As a matter of fact, it might be harder sometimes. No, but it does mean that you know, I do know a few things that have personally helped me. So what are those things? Well, one of those things is to simply ask God for help. Think about it. God is the only one who really can help us. And so throughout the day, make sure that you pray for the ability to say good and godly things. Another thing that you can do is to practice being slow to speak. And I don't mean slow, right? I mean thinking before you speak, right? Don't be quick to answer. And that's something that's true in everyday speech, right? We need to be slow in responding to the people who speak to us. Maybe take a few seconds, you know? But it's also true with things like text and email. You know, don't, don't instantly text back or email back. Someone might get a little upset, but think about it, you know? Give yourself a few seconds before you answer someone right away because you can't take it back once it's sent out, you know? So when it comes to texting or email, maybe delay it for a few minutes or even a couple hours if possible, especially if it's an email. And when you do finally respond, maybe put the THINK acronym into play. So what's THINK? Well, you think about THINK. It's an acronym and it stands for True, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind. So the T stands for, is it true? Ask yourself these things before you speak. Is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? You know, we say a lot of things that aren't necessary. And finally, K, is it kind? So try putting that into action. Think before you speak using the THINK acronym. Again, Solomon has some wise words for us over in Proverbs 10 and verse 19, where he says, When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. You need to be slow to speak. Just one more thing. Sometimes what we really need to improve our speech is heart surgery. I don't mean literal physical heart surgery but a spiritual heart surgery. Here's what James taught us about that over in, I'm sorry, here's what Jesus taught us about that over in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. There Jesus says, for out of the overflow of the heart, 
the mouth speaks. The point is, if we don't want awful stuff coming out of our mouths, then we need God's help to get that awful stuff out of our hearts or to simply not get it in there in the first place, right? So maybe the best way to do that is to fill our hearts with all kinds of good and godly things to begin with, to avoid all that filth and nasty stuff out there. That way, what comes out of our mouths, well, it reflects our faith like it should. It reflects a faith that works for taming our tongues. Again, the thing that we have to remember is that our words do have power. They do. They have the power to build up or to tear down. So share words of life, not destruction. You know, and when you think about it, our words have incredible power when it comes to our salvation. For example, here's what Jesus had to say over in Matthew chapter 12 and verses 36 and 37. He said, but I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. With that kind of warning, you'd think that would be enough to cause us to pause and to think about the words that we say before we say them. Right about now, maybe you've come to understand just how powerful our speech can be. Well, how about using your speech to ask God for help? Or maybe ask God to help others. Or maybe we need to speak up and ask God for forgiveness. Or maybe ask others for forgiveness. Or maybe we need to express thanksgiving to God for something, or maybe even thank someone else. Or maybe, just maybe, we need to use our speech to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior and be baptized. Either way, our words are very powerful. And either way, even though it's hard, it is possible to tame the tongue. If you're not a Christian today, you can be. Just use those words. Use the power of speech and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior and repent of your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. And then coming up out of the water, continue to live your life for him, living and acting good godly ways and speaking good godly language until Jesus comes back again or you go to be with him. Of course, if you're already a Christian, just remember that our tongue is powerful and to use it in good and godly ways, especially in telling others about Jesus. And so if anyone has the need to share or to seek prayer or to become a Christian for the very first time, I would like to encourage you to message us through Facebook or YouTube, or you can email me directly at minister at ovchurch.org, and we'll see what we can do to help you out. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you so much for being our God and for giving us the ability to speak, Father. And Father, as we do consider the power of our words, we pray that you do hear us and that you'll forgive us and bless us and help us to say good and godly things, those things that are helpful to others, those things that glorify you and your kingdom. In Christ we pray. Again, we want to thank you for making us a part of your Lord's Day and pray that you'll worship with us again the next time we meet here in Orangevale, Sunday mornings at 9. Of course, we understand that that might not be possible for you to get out to our building. So we do hope that you'll consider continue, that is, to continue worshiping with us on Facebook and YouTube at 11 on Sunday mornings. Thank you and God bless.